Praise the Lord. Praise the Lord, everyone. Uh, good evening. Good evening. Welcome to Crosswork Christian Center Summer Institute, uh, part one. Uh, I am so happy to, uh, to have all of you here. Uh, I am uh, still technologically challenged. I thought I was uh, uh, live streaming this. I'm still going to try to do that as we go through. Uh, but I am so happy to have all of you who are with us. Uh, please uh, pass on the link. People can register. It's still not too late uh, to get started. Uh, I am extremely excited uh, to uh, uh, introduce our guest, our lecturer, our teacher uh, for part one of the uh, Crosswork Summer Institute. Uh, this is uh, the webinar to introduce and roll out uh, a class that we will have here in Round Rock, an in-person class uh, on uh, Black history. So I am honored to have with us today, Dr. Leonard, Moore, Leonard N. Moore, the George Lord, uh, Littlefield Professor of American History at the University of Texas at Austin. And he is the author of the book, teaching black history to white people. Let me tell you, if you haven't gotten the book, there'll be more information on this uh, as we go through, uh, but I promise you, you need to get it. It is uh, an excellent read. I think it's, well, you can't see it. Let me see if I can do it this way. No, it's not working. <laughs> I, I, I'll get back to it in a minute. It's, it's an excellent, excellent uh, uh, read. And so uh, we'll put it up there. There's going to be some information on how you can get it for the class. And we'll roll out the logistics for the class um, as we uh, toward the end of our, our time together tonight. So let me uh, turn it over now to Dr. Moore. I do have some questions for him. Dr. Moore, thank you so much, sir, uh, for being with us uh, this evening and, and being uh, agreeable uh, to do this. So would you please start out? And we know that there are people, this is just not for crosswork, it's for yeah. anyone anyone in the community and anyone who can uh, be with us virtually. Uh, start out, would you just kind of share with us your story, sort of your journey of how you got here? Yeah. You know, man, I've been in the game 25 years, you know, I've been teaching Black History 25 years, just fin finished my 15th year at the University of Texas. Uh, prior to that, I was, I was at LSU in Baton Rouge. Uh, so for me, man, you know, I'm, a, I'm, a, I'm from the best city in the world, Cleveland, Ohio. Uh, and if y'all ain't been there, you, that's one place you gotta you gotta you gotta put on your bucket list. We Cleveland gets a bad rap, man, but you know, very very vibrant black community there. Um, uh, I went to Jackson State University. I, I finished high school with a 1.6 GPA. Don't laugh at me, and that's not on a two point scale, John. It's on a four point scale. Wow. Uh, got to Jackson State after my third semester. I had a 1.8 GPA, and I remember somebody asking my dad how was Leonard doing in college. And my dad responded, he's doing better in college than he uh than he did than he was he did in high school. So had kind of my, I would say my Damascus Road moment, uh spring semester, my sophomore year. I remember it vividly, John, spring 19, uh, spring uh, uh 1991. I went to my history professor's class, not paying attention, acting a fool, and he literally cussed me out at the end of class. He said, go back to Cleveland and quit wasting your parents' money. It was a very um uh I mean, he got my attention, you know, he hit a nerve. And after that, I finished my last three, five semesters, like a 3.5, went to Cleveland State University, got a master's degree in nine months. And after that, I got a PhD at Ohio State in American history. Uh, I laugh, I got it at the age of 26. I should have got it at the age of 25. And people always say, John, well, why, why, did you, why, why didn't you get it at 25? I said, I was in a crazy relationship. She was crazy and I was crazy. and We were crazy together, amen. So, um, <laughs> So, uh, but, but here's what I tell people, you know, the only reason I went to grad school is because me and a couple of my friends were playing video games late one night, about one or two in the morning. This is spring 93, the semester we're graduating. And uh, one of my boys is filling out some papers. They're like, man, what are you doing? He said, man, I'm applying to grad school. And John, I remember saying, what's that? Now understand my aunt had a PhD from Michigan. Other aunt had a doctorate from USC, but here I am talking about what's grad school, all right? And uh, he said, man, you don't like getting a master's or PhD. So I remember when he told me that, I said to myself, hell, I'm smarter than him. So the next day, <laughs> the next day, man, I went and filled out some grad school paperwork. And that's how I ended up in grad school, man. So that is sort of my story. Black history is the only thing I've ever loved. If you looked at my poor transcript from high school, the highest grades you will see on there, not PE or band, the highest grades you will see on my transcript 
African-American history, African-American literature. And here is my challenge to parents. Parents, you have got to allow your children to do what God has called them to do. And in an academic setting, I see a lot of our kids coming in, wanting to go into the STEM fields, not because they like it, not because they know anything about it, but typically because somebody in their family who ain't got no money told them, well, you can make some money if you go into this. And it is really hurting our kids. And so I don't care if it's dance, I don't care if it's theater, whatever God has called them to do, you got to let them pursue it. And so, so um, you know, I went to LSU, I was there for, you know, nearly a decade, and I've been at Texas for 15 years, man. And so uh, it's been a good ride, man. And, and, and teaching Black history is my ministry. You know, I ta I've taught over 20,000 students, and I tell people all the time that, um, you know, you know, my goal is to know him and, and to make him known through the teaching of Black history. And we have seen how when Black history is taught right, it moves on the hearts of folk who don't even like us. Wow, that, sir, there are so many sermons uh, in that, in, in what you just mentioned. Yeah. Um, I'm going to come back to uh, <laughs> and follow up with a question about, uh, because I really do think it's it's important for, uh, that that's going to help someone. Uh, because, you know, the story has been told time and time again. If you don't get good grades, you can yeah. never, uh, you, you can't recover from that. Uh, right. You cannot be successful from that. And uh, sometimes that tricks a, a lot of our, our young people. And can you just repeat again uh, uh, for the benefit of those? And by the way, those of you who have any questions, please put them uh, in the Q&A uh, part and I will do my best to uh, steward them uh, as, as best I can as we go through. Uh, please feel free to, to, to put your questions there. But could you repeat again what your GPAs, uh, the GPA that you, 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 you quoted it, two of them? It, it'll go better. I'll, I'll give you my educational DNA. How that sound? So that, that sounds great. 1.6 GPA, 15 ACT, 720 SAT. There it is right there. Wow. The GRE scores were super low. But 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 here's what I remind people all the time. Man will never be able to design an instrument to determine what God has called somebody to do. Never be able to do that. Never be able to do that. Yes. Yes. Excellent. Excellent. And uh now because you uh black history is your uh, is your, uh, your, your calling, if you will, a part of it. We will get to the other part of that in a minute. Uh, let me ask this, but before I do that, let me also acknowledge uh, uh, who are uh, a number of people who are with us uh, tonight for this uh, installment. I want to acknowledge uh, our bishop and supervisor, uh, Bishop Adam Jefferson Richardson, Sr., as well as Supervisor Dr. Connie Richardson. They are on with us. Uh, Bishop and Supervisor, thank you all uh, for being with us, as well as the members of Crosswork and other friends and family. We're going to call you family. We're all here and family together. So I want to make sure uh, that I put that. But tell me, uh, why did you then, because history is your, is, is your calling, why did you write this book which some people might think is a very, uh, say, controversial title, even though it is not, because when you read the book, you, you're very fair in what you're doing. Um, why did you write the book, Teaching Black History to White People? Because, you know, over the last 24 years, I've taught over 20,000 students, and more than half of those students have been white. And understand, this is in Louisiana and Texas, right? Two former states of the Confederacy. This is not New York, Ohio, Michigan. And so I think, man, you know, what I have found is that white Southerners, now white folk on the East Coast, those are different breed of white folk. We'll talk about them in a minute. But white Southerners, man, they are intrigued about the Black experience because they've been around us their whole life. They are intrigued about it. They talk about us all the time. And so, like you said this earlier, John, there's an intellectual curiosity that they have about Black folk. And deep down, they know they haven't done right by us. So they, they, they're trying to put the pieces of the puzzle together. And so this book was especially written for them. And, and let me say this, man. Um, I think sometimes I found white folks in the South to be very, very open 
to the learning of black history. You know, and let me give you an example. And, and just, it, just about black history. And so, I mean, I, and, and so when I, the, the white students I teach, John, these are the, the students of, of, these are real white folk, white folk from Alamo Heights in San Antonio, um, River Oaks in Houston, uh, Highland Park in Dallas, Westlake in Austin, right? These, these are real white folk. And so, man, but they love it. I got a great story to tell. There was a, a white student in my class. Uh, she was from some affluent suburb in Houston. So on the first day of class, she says, well, Dr. Moore, my mom didn't want me to take your class. And I said, why not? She said, well, my mom said, you're gonna indoctrinate me into being a liberal. I said, that's interesting. I said, so what made her change her mind? She said, well, Dr. Moore, my mom told me, you can take the class. Um, uh, she said, quote, I can take the class, but after every lecture on Tuesday and Thursday, I have to take a copy, I have to email my mom the notes, and I had to send my mom the syllabus. And every Tuesday and Thursday night, we go over on the phone as a family what we went over in class. So the mom was trying to, in many ways, be the helicopter. The mom emailed me the first week of December and, oh, help me, Holy Ghost. And this is why I love how what God does. Although the mom was intending to keep her, was, you know, was trying to shield her daughter from learning about the Black experience, do you realize the mom emailed me the first week of December, end of the semester, and she said, Dr. Moore, you have been a blessing to my family. She said, we had no idea Black people experienced this. And she said, I was skeptical about my daughter taking your class. She said, but you have been a blessing to our family and you have completely shifted our thought around Black issues. Let, let, me, let, me, let me give you a, an wow. analogy that I lay wow. out in the book. <clears throat> because see, when talking to white Southerners about this stuff, you got to put it in a way where they can receive it. They know racial inequality and racism exists. They, they don't want you to blame them for it, but they know it exists. So let me give you my, my monopoly analogy and feel free to use it. I forgot where I got it from. I don't think it was original, but it, 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 it'll bless you. So we all know about the game of monopoly, right, John? We know about yes, the game sir. of monopoly. Okay? Yes, so sir. let's say me and six of my white friends we get together and we're playing a game of Monopoly, all right? I show up at the house for dinner. Our kids are upstairs playing. We're gonna play Monopoly. We sit down, they pass out the money. You know, we, we get a piece. You got the car, you got the horse, you got the shoe, the thimble, the wheelbarrow, whatever. I know I know my Monopoly, John, all right? <laughs> yes, and so sir. I'm sitting down and I am ready to play, all right? I'm educated, you know, my parents taught me how to negotiate. But before the game starts, they say, Leonard, you know, there are separate, there's a rule for you, Leonard, because you're black. Like, what are you talking about? Leonard, you cannot buy any property until you roll for the 20th time. I'm wow. like, that ain't in the rule book, but they show me the rules and it says additional rules for Negroes cannot buy property until you roll for the 20th time. But they tell me, Leonard, you can go around the board. You got to pay taxes. You got to pay wow. rent if you land on people. And if, since you are black, Leonard, of course, you can spend time in jail. All right, so here we go. <laughs> so I'm going around the board. I have no, I can't buy any property, but I'm still motivated because my parents told me I was somebody, John. So even yes, though I'm operating against the odds, all right, yes, I got sir. the dice in my hand for the 20th time. And now I'm excited. I'm about to implement my strategy to try to get me some railroads and some stuff like that. But guess what, John? Now I got the dice in my hand, but all the property has now been bought. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. No, no property to buy. But I yes. still try to work as hard as I can. They won't, they won't let me buy property from them. I can't make no trades. I have nothing. I can't make a deal. And so our neighbor comes in late. Literally, you don't have any property. And I was like, yeah, because they discriminated against me. She says, no, Leonard, you just don't want to work hard enough. Nobody hmm. discriminated against you. This is, this is all, this is all, you know, um, the land of opportunity. Okay. So I'm still gonna play and I still ain't got no money. Here we go. We all decide to go to dinner. But my friend Sharon says, let's not end the game. Let's let our children come down and take our place. Mm. So when we get back from dinner, we can continue the game. Wow. My daughter Lauren comes from downstairs with all her white friends. She has no money, no property. Her friends say, Lauren, how come you ain't got no money, no property? She says, because y'all were racist toward my daddy. And her friends say, Lauren, you can't blame us. That happened a long time ago. Wow. Wow. Um, I, <clears throat> I don't, um, that, that, 
that analogy is so on point. I'm not going to even try to uh, uh, comment on it other than to say that in a nutshell is the black experience in a lot of ways. And, and, well, the black experience, period. Uh, and the reality is we are still trying to catch up. Absolutely. Uh, and not only now to, 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 to uh, it seems as if this country is going the wrong way. Uh, and that is um, <clears throat> now let's try and reinstitute uh, some of those times you went around the board, we need some of that money back. Come on, brother. Uh, and in fact, what we really want to do is take the peace from you hmm. because you no longer deserve to be in the game. That's right. That's right. That's right. So, I mean, that, right. that, that, oh my goodness. And, oh and my just, goodness. This is what I tell people when, when people talk about the reparations debate, we ain't got to go back to slavery. We can make a much stronger legal argument. And I know I'm talking to an attorney by looking sure. at Jim Crow. Yes, sir. When you don't allow black people to be a part of the political and economic mainstream for 80 years, but we were paying taxes. Come on, man, that, yes, that is where I think the, the, the legal argument should be because we, we have people who are still living who pay taxes into a system that they got no benefit out of. Wow, yes, sir. You mentioned a minute ago, and then I'm gonna let you just preview your book. I'm gonna turn it over to you. I could listen to you all night, sir. Uh, you mentioned a minute ago that um, you've taught uh, over 20,000 students and the majority yeah. of them uh, yeah. have been um, Anglo uh, or a lot of them have been Anglo. Uh, what has your experience been uh, from the other side of the coin, uh, from the African-American population? How have they received your, your, uh, your class? Well, it ebbs and flows, right? So I, I'll say this. Um, at times, the courses are very popular amongst Black students. And at times, they aren't. Post-George Floyd, super, super, you know, super, super popular. But, but, uh, but for some of our Black college students, particularly at white colleges, they look down upon Black history and Black studies. And here's what I tell them. Everybody in the world studies Black folk but us. <laughs> Everybody in the world knows how we spend our money. I mean, even here, man, you go talk to a sister going to a hair care spot, it's going to be owned by some Koreans. <laughs> so I, I tell people, you, you, so, so we don't even value our own history. And the mistake a lot of parents make is they think just because you are Black, you know the history. No, not at all. Uh-uh, not at all. So we have a situation now where some white kids know our history better than we do. I remember I had a student, you know, and, and it's always these corporate Negroes, John, who look down upon black history. They think it has no value. And I tell my students in Texas, okay, you go on to PWC or Accenture or Goldman Sachs, holler at me in year three. Hmm. Because when I tell them it's the black history in you that's going to sustain you and motivate you when you get up in these all white corporate environments. But Preach. sometimes we don't, we don't even appreciate it. And we look down upon it. You know, we say it has no intellectual value, no intellectual rigor. I'm like, Negro, please. <laughs> black, pe black people, we drive culture. Yes, sir. We drive culture. Yes, sir. And I tell my students all the time, what we do, we drive culture. We come up with culture in the hood. Madison Avenue finds a way to repackage it and sell our culture back to us. And because we have no identity, we end up going to Saks Fifth Avenue and Neiman Marcus to buy our identity off the rack when what mm. we are buying is something we started in the community anyway. Oh. Oh, my goodness, sir. You, uh, you're preaching. You, you're, <laughs> I tell you what, I'm going to get out of the way. No, and I'm going to let you preview your book uh, all right, all right. and you can, uh, I'm excited. And by the way, uh, let me just say this to you. Uh, we'll give you information on how to get the book. I, I, there is one story I'd like for you to tell because okay. sometimes um, there is this, what I call this dichotomy between uh, those of us who went to college and maybe how the world, not only how we view the world, 
but uh, more importantly, how the world responds to us mm -hmm. and those of us who didn't get that opportunity or college was not their calling. Mm -hmm. And so there's a there's a story in the book that you tell. Uh, and I don't know if I'm getting ahead and you want to wait to the class to tell it. But you tell a story about uh, driving, I believe it was to California and you get pulled over uh, in West Texas. Mm -hmm. uh, can you do you mind sharing that story uh, now or is that part of the curriculum you're going to get later? <laughs> you know, man, it's, it's funny because uh, when all the George Floyd, Breonna Taylor stuff went down, me and the president of UT did a little conversation for the whole university community. And my white colleagues are surprised that I deal with police harassment. Literally, they go, Leonard, you, yeah, yes, me. <laughs> All right, yes, me. Hmm. Yes, and so sir. situation, man, we were coming back from the Grand Canyon. Okay. Uh, and we got right inside West Texas, man. And officer pulled me over, me and my wife and my three kids in the car. And he pulls me over. And I said, why did you pull me over? He said, because when you change lanes, you didn't give the 18-wheeler the in front of you enough space. I'm like, come on, man. So anyway... Here is the questioning that went on when he pulled me over, all right? Pulls me over, uh, where you going? I'm going to Austin, Texas, where you coming from? We're originally Pasadena, California, coming through the Grand Canyon. Uh, where do you live at? I live in Round Rock. What do you do for a living? I teach at the University of Texas. Uh, what subject do you teach? I say, I'm a history professor. Are you tenured? Yes, I'm a tenured professor. Then, then he hit me with this. What classes did you teach? Do you teach? Now I got a loud little bit, Cause ain't no way I'm gonna tell this cowboy, I teach a class on the black power movement and a class called race in the age of Trump. I say, man, I just teach regular American history. He said, you don't have a specialization? I said, no, not really. He said, well, most professors have, a I said, no man, just American history. Then he says this, what kind of car do you drive? This I'm is like, when you're pulled over. Wait, wait, let me make over. sure. You're pulled over on the side of the road for, <laughs> A purported illegal lane change, and this right. is this is he asks you that. Right. Then he asked me, "What does your wife do for a living?" I say, "She works at the university as well." What kind of car does she drive? Then he says, "Mr. Moore, I need you to get out of the car and go sit in the police cruiser for me." I get out of the car. I go sit in the police cruiser. There are two German shepherds in the back of the car. All right. And me and that officer sitting at that front seat for about 15 minutes. I guess he was running my stuff. And I told my wife, it's at times like that where you understand that all the officer has to do is pull out his gun and shoot you and kill you. And his whole defense would be, Mr. Moore went for my weapon. And, and, and when I tell people this stuff, and, and I tell white people, why, why, why would we make this up? You know, what do we have to gain by making it up? You know what I mean? Yes, but, sir. you know, and, and they seem surprised. I'm mean, every morning when I'm going down I-35 to campus, I get terrified if a white police officer gets behind me and my white colleagues just can't seem to can't seem to grasp that. Let me make sure that I, I understand what you're just telling. You are coming from with the family from California through uh, Arizona to the Grand Canyon. You get to uh, the Panhandle, West mm -hmm. Texas. You get pulled over because of a uh, purported illegal lane change. And then you you have to give a discourse on uh, not only your vocation, but your wife's vocation. And then you have to give them some societal, a sociological information regarding uh, what kind of car do you and your wife uh, drive. And then you go sit in the car for 15 minutes. Yes. And when he ran your record and, and found that there was nothing there, uh, how did he end the exchange? He said, Mr. Moore, sorry for detaining you. I'm just trying to do my job to keep us all safe. Okay. Yeah, that was it, brother. Yeah. I could say a lot right there. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. All right. Uh, yeah. Yeah. Uh, and I think a number of us have have uh, have have experienced that. Uh, I remember coming from the law school. Uh, my first year, I was a first year student at UT. Coming from the law library one uh, one night, I lived in South Austin. 
mm -hmm. uh, off Stastny. So when I exited my car, uh, well, no, when I exited the uh, interstate to go across the uh, overpass, uh, an officer pulled me over. Mm -hmm. And he said, I'm sorry, sir, I got to pull you over because there's been a robbery here uh, in, in the South Austin area. And uh, the description is a, uh, a black man with short hair and a gray car. So I need Stop, you to pull God. over. No, sir. And so I get out. He gets right. me out. I'm a first year law student. Uh, he gets me out. And then uh, two other police officers, uh, two other cars come. They pull my stuff out of the car and they search me. Man. Wow. And then they they put my stuff back in there and they say, uh, OK, have a nice night. So uh, you, you just, wow. and there are, I'm sure there are a number of people who are on with us this evening who understand uh, and have similar stories. It doesn't matter your educational right. level, yeah. nor does it matter uh, your, uh, your, your socioeconomic status, the right. skin, the color of your skin uh, still uh, lets you know that it doesn't matter how wealthy you are or how right. accomplished you are, there is still an issue. John, my oh. son gets his license on July 5th. He's about 6'2 now, 16. So, wow. you, know, he's been, you know, he's been, you know, he's been. 6'2? Yeah, you know, he's been on his football recruiting visits. Yes. And, you know, you, whenever you go on a visit, you get a little lanyard with the school logo and all that kind of stuff. So we went to A&M last year and they gave us one. I told him, when you get that car, it is, I am requiring you to put that Texas A&M lanyard on your rear view mirror. And let me tell you the message to my madness. Yes, sir. Because if a white cop pulls you over and they see that, you will, in many ways, you, you will disarm him and the discussion can shift the football. It's crazy that we got to do it, man. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. <laughs> yes, sir. Go ahead and preview your book, sir. Okay. Go ahead and preview your book. So, so you know, I, I won't be too long, but I kind of just wanted to take people through a narrative of American Black history. And we start the book off talking about the three places in the Constitution where slavery and race are mentioned. Uh, one, uh, the three-fifths compromise. You know about that. We were designated three-fifths of a person for representation purposes. Two, uh, where it talks about the Atlantic slave trade, a constitution written 1787, in the Constitution, it says that the Atlantic slave trade will end in 1808. So between 1787 and 1808, of course, though 21 year period, you had boatloads of Africans being brought into the country because they believed again that it would be outlawed in 1808. And the third place it's mentioned in the Constitution as it relates to the Fugitive Slave Act where the law said, if you were an enslaved African and you made it to a free state, um, your, your, your slave master could come to the free state and get you and bring you back into bondage. And so when we talk about slavery, I, we, we want to be very clear on language. We're not going to call anybody a slave. We're going to say that they are enslaved. And that's, that is a big distinction. Because when you say slaves, like talking about a chicken, a hog, a mule, but when you say enslaved, you are giving them some dignity and you, know, you, you are giving them some humanity because these are people. Yes, sir. These are people, you know what I mean? So, so that is big. And we talk about the plantation. We'll talk about how men were treated versus women. And we talk about all that stuff. And then we talk about this concept of being sold down the river. Most people don't realize we associate slavery with Mississippi, Louisiana, Alabama, but it started in Virginia and it was there the longest. But the reason many of us got down here is because of what we call the Atlantic slave trade the trade, the domestic slave trade, the trading of enslaved people within the United States, really moving enslaved people from Virginia, Maryland, North Carolina, South Carolina, to Mississippi, Louisiana, Texas, Arkansas, right? Between 1820 and 1860. I'm gonna give you one statistic. So the phrase was, you heard this before, being sold down the river. Have you heard that phrase before? Yes. Enslaved yes. people didn't want to be sold down the river because they knew slavery was a lot more brutal in this portion of the country. King Cotton would be the catalyst for the domestic slave trade. Two statistics. Here we go. When we talk about the domestic slave trade, the trading of Black people within the United States, you're talking about more than one million transactions. 
Mm. That doesn't mean a million people were sold. It means a million transactions because you could be sold multiple times. Here we go. 75% of every sale involved the destruction of nuclear family. 50% of every transaction involved the destruction of a first marriage. So you're talking about the black family being completely decimated, okay? Now, when we get to the Juneteenth generation, I tell people this is the most dynamic generation of Americans ever. I don't care what Tom Brokaw said about the greatest generation. The greatest generation of people ever to set foot in this country were those 4 million black folk who came out of slavery. And by 1875, John, and y'all gotta get this, between 1865 and 1875, these folks were so dynamic, they built up prosperous, self-sustaining communities, didn't need the white man. And the reason we know they were successful is because a response to that black prosperity was something nobody had ever seen before. And that's segregation and Jim Crow. Hmm. Hmm. Wow. 1865, 1875, we move off the plantation. We change our names. We reunite our families, we acquire property, we build schools, we build churches, and we establish business enterprise. By 1875, we are a self-sustaining community and we are so prosperous that white Southerners gotta come up with a way to hmm. basically erase all that prosperity. And that is why, that's how you get Jim Crow. Jim Crow initially is about a psychological piece because since I don't own you anymore, I have to remind you that you were inferior to me. So that's why I'm gonna separate you. Second component of Jim Crow, we gotta take away your right to vote that you got during reconstruction. Grandfather clause, that kind of stuff, right? Uh, grandfather clause, literacy test. So I gotta mess with you psychologically. I gotta take away your right to vote. Now I got to manipulate the economic system and I'm going to implement sharecropping, which will keep you perpetually in debt. But sharecropping works for everybody because I got you back in the field working and the economy is moving and you think you got freedom, but you can't leave because every year you owe me money. Then I got to deal with the criminal justice system and that's where we get convict leasing. I tell people white Southerners did not want to waste any money on building prisons. Why would we have those black folks sitting in a prison? We can have them out in the field working. Sugarland, Texas, a prosperous suburb in Houston, used to be a, a convict leasing uh, camp where basically we need people back in the field to work. So what we do, we would come up with crazy laws, laws like loitering, vagrancy, idleness. We would indict you, convict you of it, and John, next thing you know, you being leased out on a plantation for two or three years. Then the last component of Jim Crow, which is the most vicious, is racial violence and lynching. So even with that during the Jim Crow period, I tell people, Black people, even during that period of terror during Jim Crow, we did 90% of all of our institution building during that period. Follow me. With the exception of the AME Church. <laughs> Pretty much every other African-American church denomination was established during the Jim Crow period. Church of God in Christ, Church of Christ Holiness, all that kind of stuff. Southern, I mean, uh, uh, National Baptist Convention, your eight African-American fraternities and sororities established during the Jim Crow period. 95% of all HBCUs established during the Jim Crow period. All your professional organizations, National Medical Association, the dentist group, the black businesses, all, teachers, all of that. So when we are oppressed and are getting terrorized, that's when we do some dynamic institution building. And here's why institution building is so critical. Because it seems like the last 40 or 50 years, most of our power has been individual. Hmm. But they understood during the Jim Crow period, no, we got to have institutions that will outlive even our best leaders and our greatest personalities, all right? So World War I, I'm taking through this quick. You got the Great Migration. Take your time. 1.5 million Black people would leave the South and would go New York, Philly, Detroit, Cleveland, Chicago, Gary, St. Louis, Boston, in search of greater economic opportunities. When white men in World War I are off fighting, the factories in the North need men to work. 
So what do they do? They recruit people from the South, black folk, who will go up North and we call this the field to factory migration. Now, you would think since what that white folks in the South didn't want us around. So you would think white people would be excited that we were going to the North. Not at all. And we'll talk about the ways they tried to keep black folk in the South. World War II, second great migration. This is the big one. 1945 to 1965, 3 million black folk gonna lead the South. Boston, New York, Philly, Detroit, Chicago, Cleveland, St. Louis. But now we are gonna throw in Los Angeles, Oakland, San Francisco, and Seattle. A big migration from Texas to California because it was just as close to Texas, California, Texas to Chicago. So check this out. There's a great story uh, in this book, The Warmth of Other Suns. And so people talked about people leaving Louisiana migrating. So this one brother said, if you lived in Louisiana and you wanted to go west, he said, if you had like a beat up car, you would stop in Beaumont and just live there. He said, if you had a decent car, you would make it to Houston. He said, but if you were lucky and had a real nice car, that put, could put some miles on it, you made it all the way to LA, all right? So just talking about, in another story from the migration, I don't know how many of you all have ever been to Newark, New Jersey, all right? Mm -hmm. They said that during the migration, the reason Newark, New Jersey's population blew up is because black folk in the South thought the train conductor was saying New York, and he hmm. was saying Newark, <laughs> so they just got <laughs> off in Newark Thinking it, was, thinking it was New York City. Say, like, hell, we here now, all right? But the migration is interesting. And I tell people, um, my, in, my, my grandparents migrated to Cleveland from Mississippi, but then they moved to Los Angeles in 1961. So the whole migration story, and when I was a student at Jackson State, a lot of us from Cleveland, Detroit, Chicago had relatives in the South. And I remember taking the train home like for Christmas break, and it would be, the train would start in New Orleans. So it, it got students on there from Dillard, Xavier, Suno. It comes up to Jackson. It picks up the Jackson State folks. It's going to curve over to Memphis, getting them folk from Tennessee State and all the other smaller HBCUs. But what we had in common, we were all from the North who went to school in the South because we had relatives in the South. All right. Mm. Now, I like to tell a story real quick of just how about lynching and racial terror. My mother is from Franklinton, Louisiana, a town not too far. It borders Mississippi on both sides, okay? Um, not too far from a town called Tylertown in Bogalusa. But anyway, growing up in Cleveland, Ohio, and I'll be brief with this story. When I saw my grandfather, he always, it looked as if John, like somebody had taken the life out of him, you know? Um, yes, good husband, struggle with alcohol, you know, smoke Winston cigarettes every day. Um, you know, it just seemed like it's somewhere, and I couldn't figure it out. Him and his two brothers, man, they were, you would think they were triplets, but they weren't. They all struggled with alcohol, couldn't keep a job, and just very irresponsible, all right? Yeah. Then I came across this lynching in Franklinton, Louisiana in 1934. Front page New York Times, 1935, front page New York Times. And I come to find out that that was my mother's cousin, and it was, it was the guy my grandfather hung out with. Wow. So when you see yep. your cousin get lynched in 1935 and you were 18, it takes life out of you. Yes. And sir. so that lynching piece, and I remember my grandmother who died in 07, I remember, you know, I think it was the 04 election. I said, Grandma, are you going to vote? Here's what she said. She said, baby, voting is white folks' business. Mm. She was still traumatized from mm. the lynching. Yes, sir. This thing where, you know, as long as you stay in your place, you'll be okay, all right? Um, and so these stories, man, affect Black families. You know, we got a lot of this racial terror and stuff in our family. So then we get to this, we'll talk about the civil rights period and the Black power period. And the one thing I want to point out about the civil rights period, and we need to, we need, we're going to, we're going to stop all this myth making right now. <laughs> you had two kind of people. You have what we call an organizer and a mobilizer. MLK is going to be a mobilizer. That's what he is. He comes to town, people show up. But he, ain't, he wasn't doing the day-to-day -day grassroots work of raising the consciousness of the people. 
and that work was largely done by black women. Yeah. Yes. So we'll talk about that distinction. Then we'll talk about the black power. And, I, and I'll end on this, John. When when we started talking about uh, when we introduced when, when when black history and black studies first came into college campuses, very controversial. Here's what white administrators said. Number one, black people haven't made a contribution to American society that would warrant a 15 week semester course. Wow. That was the first. The second issue was, well, if we offer the course, will the course have, will the course have any kind of intellectual value? That was two. The third pushback was, Will students, are there, do our students even interested in this topic? And the fourth critique was, um, who will we find to teach the course? So I tell you all the time, me even teaching these courses in a university setting is radical in and of itself because they we weren't always wanted there. And even now, I tell people all the time, even now, I had a situation at LSU. Hey, I want to teach black students. I, I want to teach black students. And I got a heart for black students at large white schools. So I'm at LSU teaching all these black students. And one day I had about 15 black students in my office, John. We having a good old time. Yes, sir. Black professor, older black professor comes by. He talked, we, we, we talked later that day. He said, man, I wouldn't have all them black students in my class and all them black students in my office. I said, why not? He said, it just don't look good. And I said, hey man, I'm gonna do what God has called me to do. These are students and I'm not gonna play that game you've been playing your whole life. I could care less what people think of me, but this is how we are gonna operate. So, um, so the class will be fun. You'll have a syllabus. We'll show some slides, we'll show some video clips. And I think it'll be transformative, particularly if you've never really gotten this before. You know, Some of us have watched Roots. Some of us have been to the museum in DC, but we got a lot of gaps that we're gonna fill in uh, over, over those four weeks. Man, you have you have made this so exciting. I've read the book and I can't wait to uh, to take the class. Uh, I'm going to ask you all now uh, to submit your questions. We're at the Q and A part. Uh, there's a question here now, and the question that that was posed, uh, Dr. Moore, is so: How do we account for the legislation about teaching critical race theory and Black history, generally espoused by Governor Abbott and Governor DeSantis? Great, great question. Let me say this. Critical race theory is a, an invention of white liberals. We don't need say critical more about race that. theory. We wait. need black history. All right. Say, well, wait, before okay. say, say that, repeat that again and say more about that. <laughs> Although critical race theory was, 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 was turned coined by a black woman, I believe white liberals latch onto that. Because as long as you're talking race, I'm cool. But when you start talking specifically about black folk, and I don't think they want us specifically to talk about our experience. Well, I embrace all ethnic groups. Our concern needs to be the teaching of black history. All right, and, and here's what I tell you all the time. And here's where we, we have messed up, John. Don't expect the white man to teach your kids about themselves. We need to be teaching black history at churches, in community centers. You know, and, you know I talked to my black Greek organizations, don't rely upon a, an ISD or a school system to teach your kid black history. We need to do it and we do it, we can do the way we wanna do it. Yes, sir. Does that make sense? Yes, we, we can yes, sir. choose the books we wanna choose, we can use the images, all that kind of stuff. So to me, what Abbott and DeSantis are doing, it's a gut check to us. Cause see, sometimes you gotta be forced out of your comfort zone. You feel yes, me? Sir. So we can't yes, rely sir. upon them to teach us. They, 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 they've never been comfortable with it. And often if I'm honest, oftentimes they teach it wrong. So I'd rather yes. you not teach it at all. <laughs> <laughs> so we can teach, teach it, right. it right. That's right. Mm -hmm. Uh, you, you're, you're right. And, and, and so why do you think so many people, why do you think, um, there's this, uh, phobia manufactured phobia let me, to let me tell critical you what it is. race theory? Let Where's me tell you what it is. And 
there are a group of people out there I call diverse, diversity consultants. Very little training, they making a buck. buck. But I, I went to some of these trainings, man, and I told these people, y'all going, y'all are about to trigger a significant backlash. Here's how the trainings would go, John. They would basically say, well, if you're white, uh, you, you're an oppressor. If you're a man, you, you, you're automatically patriot. You know what I'm saying? They, they were just doing all this, throwing all the people together. And I said, that ain't gonna go over well with some people. You know what I'm saying? You know, um, if, if you ask a question about gay marriage, oh, you must be homophobic. And so what, what has happened, John, I'm just being honest, in a lot of academic circles, that culture has been, that culture has been created. Where if you're a man, you're automatically, you're automatically sexist, okay? If you're white, you're automatically racist and you automatically got privilege. I tell you this all the time. I know a whole bunch of poor white folks live in Ohio. You may think they got privilege. They don't think they got it. And so, all, and so you had this group of people. And so what happened, man, they, these group of folks, John, started doing things in the K through 12 setting, telling white teachers, well, you're, 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 you know, you're part of the oppressive class. And I think, man, that's where a lot of the pushback started. Let me say this. I've been teaching Black history 25 years, and I've never had a problem with anybody saying don't teach Black history. But what has happened is you got these people now saying, well, if you're white, you're automatically a racist. And people are pushing back against that. Interesting. Another question we have is how do we stay positive when we're still dealing with racial inequality? Um, I think I think black folks should be pessimistic. You know, uh, I just got back from South Africa. You know, I've run study abroad programs there. You know, and there I teach a class with UT students, and I reminded them, if you look at apartheid legislation, John, apartheid legislation was passed over a period of 25 years. I think like the first law was like early 1920s, mid 1920s, or 1913. And what it is, man, it is a slow chipping away. So one law in and of itself, John, doesn't seem so bad. But I'm telling you, you can say what you want about the Republicans. They are very strategic. They are very methodical. And they play the long game. Yes. They sir. knew years ago, we just want to get a hold of the federal judiciary. And y'all can do whatever the hell y'all want to do. So I think for black folk, it's let's stop assuming let's let's I mean, we have to be about institution building. And, and my, my grandmother went to Christmas Addicts High School in Indianapolis. And at the time, John, 1920s, they said it was the best high school in the country, black or white. Here is why. In Indianapolis, the black community was spread out. There wasn't no large. And so the black parents got together in the 1920s. They said we want an all black high school. <laughs> <laughs> and so every black person in Indianapolis went to that high school and they said 30 to 40 percent of the teachers had advanced degrees. Some even had PhDs. And we need to be thinking about that in Austin. Where you have a declining black population, our kids are isolated by themselves, 5 percent at Round Rock High School, even the high schools that people think are black, like Hendrickson, maybe 20 percent black. And so my point is, we got to start thinking about our future as more and more of these laws get passed. And I'll say this, and I've been saying this for five years, we have gotten all we're gonna get from white folks. You're not getting nothing else. Say more about that. You've gotten all the legislation you're gonna get. White people do not feel guilty anymore. And I think for a long time, our public policy was based around white guilt. White people are struggling themselves. And so I think for us to constantly look for government intervention or something like that, it ain't happening. Interesting. Excellent. Excellent. Uh, any more questions? We're going to wrap it up. We're going to give us give it about eight more minutes. Please put your questions in the chat. Uh, here's a question. How does the mask of a racially inclusive society contribute black people contribute to black people's disinterest in learning our history? What was the first part of that? The mask. How does what? the mask in quotation marks of a racially inclusive society contribute to black people's disinterest in learning our history? I mean, we don't, we don't tell the history enough. Like I say in the book, we may have a little, 
uh, Black History Program at church. You know, we may talk about it at the family reunion, but we don't talk about it nearly enough. And the one thing I tell parents, particularly, you know, uh, you know, parents who have done well professionally, those, tell your stories. Come home and tell. I tell my kids what I deal with all the time. About how the time two years ago, I showed up at a faculty senate meeting at Texas, John, and, and they referred to me as the assistant basketball coach. I'm like, man, I can't, I can't even be the head coach. <laughs> <laughs> I'm not surprised. But you got to tell the story. Yes. And you got to sit down with your boys and show them Emmett Till. Yes. You can't, and show roots and told, you got to show all that stuff and don't shield it from them. Because here's the thing, although your kids may not come home talking about what they deal with racially in school, you best believe black kids in suburban schools are having racialized experiences as young as three or four years of age. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. It is, it is, it is, it is systemic. Um, I think you're right. We do have to, we have to teach it at home. And let me also say, uh, I believe this may get me in trouble for saying it, but I believe the church mm -hmm. needs to also make up the difference. Absolutely. So what I mean by that is if it is not being taught, uh, I, I like what you said a minute ago about, you know, we're going to outlaw critical race theory and, 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 you know, there's some crazy legislation out there uh, that, 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 that proposes to strip one of one's tenure. If, if they're talking about, if they're right. teaching uh, uh, critical race theory, I, I think the church ought to say basically, so what? So if we can't, if it, if it, if it's not going to be taught there, you can guarantee it's going to be taught here. Right. And right. we're not going to apologize for doing Absolutely. it. Uh, we're not going to say we're sorry. We're not going to hesitate uh, because it's it's our our responsibility uh, to do that, to try to make up for the shortfall, because you're right. Uh, you know, if it's not being taught, if it's not being in, in even the, the, the bad, you know, because yeah. one of the things and this happens, you can see it now there, there's this uh, what I would call. I don't, I don't know the actual term for it, but it's it's sort of um, normalizing uh, yes. Christianity, for instance. You have some churches, and I'm just talking about what I'm talking about. You have some <laughs> churches now who don't want to uh, use the cross Come on, uh, because the cross is 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 a symbol of of violence, and and it makes me uncomfortable. Um, and so we have that kind of society, we have that kind right. of mentality going. So you're right. It, it's, it's up to us. It's up to, uh, to us, the, the church and, and any other black organization, we ought to, we ought to be obligated and, and, and the obligation ought not be uh, legislatively done within our, our, our organizations. Absolutely. It ought to be moral. It should be in our DNA. That's right. Check this out, John. I tell people the black church is still the most important institution in the black community even yes, with all sir. our issues. And, and I remind students all the time that the typical black church got 75 members. The pastor is bivocational. The pastor ain't driving a Bentley. The pastor ain't got a private jet. And the pastor is probably paying to pastor as opposed to getting these big prosperity offerings. And so <laughs> my thing Say is, what, what, if, what if we said at, at collectively as a black church, we gonna put a hiatus on Bible study for the next year. Because if we honest, most of our members are educated way beyond a level of obedience. If we are just honest, all right? Yes, what sir. if we just said, instead of Bible study for the next year, we're encouraging every African-American church to offer a, a black history course uh, for their members. Well, could, could you imagine how powerful that would be, man? It would be transformative. Absolutely. It would be transformative. All right, we got some questions. You generated some. Uh, for someone of mixed race, how do you advocate for your black side in a way that other minorities don't get tired of or that their experience isn't important? I don't worry. Here's what I realized. I don't worry about other folk. When I was in my VP role at Texas, oh, Dr. Moore, it seemed like you're favoring black people. We four and a half percent at UT. The Latino community was 24 percent. Asians are 24 percent. You tell me where the hell I should put my energy at. And that's why we got to be careful with this terminology like people of color, they came up with another term now, BIPOC, black and indigenous people of color. No, we are talking about black people. 
And for me, I told people, I have Mexican American colleagues who can lead that fight. But for us, let's, I mean, let's quit being worried about other people because here's the thing. We are the only people who think about us. Don't nobody else think about us. And I'm gonna give you a statistic. They talked about the Mexican American vote in, in Texas. They say the Republican, that Mexican Americans may give the Republicans a larger percentage of their vote in 2022 and 2024 than they did in 2016. So we talk all this stuff about, oh, the black brown coalition. I ain't never seen nothing like that. But we have to be comfortable saying, you know, other groups have their issues. I will let them speak for themselves. But as for me and my house, we talking about black people. All right. All right. Here's another one for clarification. Other minority. Uh, uh, there are other minority sides who struggle as well, almost like not honoring your other half. I think that may be uh, a, a, an extension of the of the uh, other question. How do you and, and, and let's talk about that, because that's a great that is a, a, a great question and brings up a good point for those biracial families and those children who are being reared, who, who, who are born out of biracial families. Do you find uh, and have you found in your uh, teaching and in, uh, in your experience, uh, is there a, a, a set of issues that is unique to them and how have they dealt with that? When I have biracial students and they speak up, I ask them, I say, okay, which side of the family have you felt most accepted by? Listen, black and white couple, 70%, they're gonna say probably the African American family, you know? So they they struggle within their own family for acceptance. And they will talk about, you know, how, how the white mom or the white dad had issues with their own family. So I mean, I think that the mixed race piece is important, but 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 what I but but if you are mixed race, I mean, understand you have a foot in both worlds, right? I mean, and I, talk to your parents. You know, I mean, I've been sitting. No, you know, what did your parents teach you about your black side? What teach you about your white side? You know, I know some brothers who've married white women, and it's like they became white too. <laughs> <laughs> Understood. Understood. Got another question. Your uh, someone wants to know when does your class at UT start? Uh, or no, I guess this is, well, I'm a, if it's the class that Crosswork is doing, uh, he and I were just talking about this a minute ago. Uh, if it's the class that Crosswork is doing, I'm going to get to that in a minute. Uh, I will tell you that if you uh, want to come uh, and visit one of his uh, lectures, uh, I, I, I've been there, so I know, uh, he more than welcomes uh, you to come. Uh, and I, with the time that Aaron and I went, uh, I would say that uh, that class that he was teaching probably was at least 50%, maybe more white students uh, that were there. And he, he gets raw, he gets provocative. Uh, it's all thought. And uh, one of the things that I like about him, and he, he, he said this, in his class. And, and Leonard, I'd like for you, if you can, to just speak on this. You, you, you applauded a student who pushed back in your class. And you made some statements about that. Uh, you did not try to downgrade them. Uh, you applauded them. You encouraged them. Say more about that. W why did you do that? I don't know. I mean, in the, in the age of Google, Google has all the content for every class, right? <laughs> Somewhere. The role of the professor is to be provocative. The role of the, of the professor is to get students to think. And it's also designed to push their buttons so they can grow intellectually. And for me, you know, some of our students are going to be environments that say, you got to get used to being environments where people express views you don't agree with. And you can't get mad. You can't get upset. You can't run the HR. Sometimes you got to sit there and, and sit through it in debate. And so I love when students push back because I think, that's what the college campus is all about. Now I tell my students on the first day of class that my class will not become a left-wing liberal echo chamber. Hmm. Because most Americans live in the middle. We are not on the extremes. You know what I'm saying? I, let's, let's take the issue of the, the transgender swimmer at Penn 
who identified as a man last year and swam on the men's team, didn't win nothing. I guess underwent some kind of procedure, now identified as a woman, swam on the women's team and won NCAA, set NCAA records. Here's the kind of conversation we should have. That person has a right to have, you know, whatever they call sex change, undergo surgery, and they have a right to swim. I don't think they have a right to swim collegiately because you, you're talking about now an issue of competitive, competitive fairness. But they, but liberals take it as, oh no, you're being transphobic. No, I'm not being transphobic. That person could swim at the YMCA. They could swim at a park. They could swim anywhere. But we, if you say it is a civil rights issue that this person should be able to compete on the women's team, that's where I push back. And my thing is this, we need to have those honest conversations in a college classroom without people being labeled certain things. Excellent. Uh, any other questions? We're almost done. We're almost done. I want to thank you all for, for doing this. I never did. I don't think this ever got to live stream, but we're going to, we're going to, that's okay. We're going to reduce it and we're going to, we're going to put it out there. Uh, we'll, we'll premiere it as a, as a, as a video. Um, so uh, I'm going to give you a couple more, uh, about another minute to, to submit any questions you may have. Uh, Dr. Moore, uh, uh, I called you Leonard. Uh, Leonard, it, it's it's uh, it's been great, man. I'm looking forward to the class. So thank you. Logistics on the class. So the class will be held in person at the Baca Center in Round Rock, Texas, for four weeks, mm -hmm. beginning July the 11th, from 6:30 to 8:30 each Tuesday. One of the things that that he and I were discussing a minute ago, I said, you know. Uh, I don't know. One of the reasons we wanted to do it in person is to to have um, to have uh, this dialogue and there's something about being in the room together. There's a synergy that you cannot necessarily get uh, uh, virtually, but also to be uh, to be uh, a blessing to the Round Rock community. We're going to open it up. And, but I did say we may have to. I'm sorry, July 12th. That's right. Uh, July 11th is a Monday. Um, that we may have to revisit whether or not we're going to do it virtually. So Dr. Moore and I are talking about that. Uh, if there's a demand for it, uh, we definitely will do it because I'm telling you, if you haven't read the book, you need to read the book. By the way, let me, let me tell you what's going to happen. We're going to post a Google something google list or something i, I I'm, I'm i'm showing my ignorance now uh you, you'll have a link to go to a a google sheet where you'll sign up for the class when you sign up for the class uh we're going to uh, we're purchasing uh we're bulk purchasing dr moore's book i think if you go online to get it i think it it retails for twenty dollars we're going to sell it. We're going to bulk purchase it and sell it to those of, of you who want to come to the class at a reduced rate. Uh, so uh, probably $15. It may even be $10. Now he's not being taken advantage of there. We are, we are, this is a part of the ministry uh, for crosswork. So we're paying full price. We're just not passing that full price uh onto onto uh, onto the students so to get in the class though you have to sign up and you have to purchase a book now if you don't you don't have to purchase it through us you can go to amazon and purchase it or wherever you want to it's 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 everywhere uh out there uh but you have to purchase a book you will not be let in the physical class without your book that is your ticket to come and the reason I'm the reason we're doing this is because we want to make sure this is not a class for you to come in and sit for two hours and just listen. Yeah. This is a class that's going to require you to actually do reading. You need to read the book, uh, read it uh, in its entirety, um, and uh, you don't have to read it all in one sitting. Although you, you might, I'll tell you this quick story. When I got the book from Leonard. Um, I, uh, I put it down and my wife picked it up and I told her, I said, uh, okay, now I just got this book. I showed her one. I had just gotten it. I showed her one page of it and, uh, I went to get it back and she said, wait a minute. I said, it doesn't take you long. It doesn't take that long to read that one page. I'm reading this book. 
uh, and so we had a little competition going when the book was lying around, she would pick it up. Like when I was at work or gone to run an errand or at a meeting or something. And then, you know, she would try to pass me. So finally, uh, Leonard, I just took the book and, and kept it until I, till I finished with it. So <laughs> Thank you, man. I, I'm just Thank saying you. that that is a good, it, you will learn something, even though if you think you are well-versed in African-American history, uh, you will, uh, you will learn something. I think I have another question that has been raised. Uh, okay. Uh, <laughs> uh, somebody has emphatically said, we need this to be virtual. <laughs> so we will, we will, we will work on that. Work That's duly noted, uh, sir. Uh, Bishop Richardson wanted you to know, uh, Dr. Moore, that this has been rich, uh, and it has, and I promise you all, you need to come to his class mm -hmm. and, and he is just as energetic, uh, in his class, uh, as he is here. It's just at another level when you see it live, because you can tell that he literally breathes and eats this, this is his passion. Uh, and it is his ministry. By the way, he is a minister, but we'll we'll leave that for another. We'll leave that for another topic, another another time. Let me see if there are any other comments. Let me. Um, uh, yes, the 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 class right now will be two hours, six thirty to eight thirty on Tuesdays, beginning July twelfth, July twelfth. 19th, 26th, and August 3rd, I think, August 2nd, one of those. And they'll be from 6.30 to 8.30 at the Allen Baca Center in Round Rock, Texas. Please. John, we'll, get them a, we'll get them a syllabus too when they register. We'll yes, okay, good. Yeah. We'll get a syllabus. He has prepared a syllabus um, uh, for you. Uh, Dr. Uh, Connie Richardson, uh, our Episcopal supervisor, also uh, Dr. Moore says, thank you so much for uh, for your comments. Thank there you. are a number of comments in the chat. Everybody uh, has loved this. Um, and I am so happy uh, that you all, uh, you all took time out of your busy schedules uh, to come and be with us. I'm excited about this, uh, about this uh, uh, institute. Uh, and just to, to, to give you more, when we finish this four-week institute, we're going to also have another, this one will be virtual, where we will have an economist awesome. who will come and talk to us about inflation, how it happened, whose fault was it, is it President Biden's fault, wow. is it President Trump's fault, and it's all. this person will also give us some tools for weathering this inflation, uh, this thing called inflation. The last thing we're going to do is we got we we got someone who will be coming to us uh, from Edward Jones. It will be virtual. We're going to talk about investments and strategy and and how to invest. The, the, the biggest lie that that has been told out there, and I want you all to please hear me, is that people say I don't have enough money to invest. That's a lie. You, if you've got five extra dollars, you can invest in that. It's just a matter of getting started and knowing how to do it. And speaking of that, that's one of the things that we ought to be teaching our kids, and that is how to invest. So we're gonna. That's gonna be a uh, part of the uh, Crosswork Summer Institute. We are excited about that. Uh, so stay tuned. But for the next four weeks, beginning July 12, not next week, yeah. but July 12. We'll have uh, we'll have this. Let me see, Leonard. Um, I will. The registration link uh, is not up yet. It will be up. Uh, we'll put it up on Facebook and our uh, uh, for those of you who have uh, registered for this class, we will endeavor uh, to get an email to you as well so that you can register for the class. Uh, Dr. Moore, I'm yeah. done. Is there anything else that you want to do, I, I should have started this with prayer. We will definitely end it with prayer, but I'd, I'd like to leave the last comments to you. No, I just want to thank you all. And, you know, I think this is a, this is a pivotal time for the black church. Um, I'm encouraged by this younger generation. Uh, you know, they, they, you know, they, they believe in Jesus. They believe in the value of the black church. They just want to see the black church be more engaged in social justice issues. So I think there's a good opportunity, even through this first summer Institute, this class, to get some young people involved, man. And so I want to thank you for your leadership, man. Oh, listen, I'm, I'm honored. And by the way, those of you who are on, please tell more people. We want to feel that we want to be able to tell people we're sorry. We are at capacity. Mm -hmm. All right. And this is, this is not, and I'm going to say this now, 
uh, this won't give me, it might get me in trouble, but I don't care. To my evangelical brothers and sisters mm. yeah. who are looking at this struggle that we have out here and you say you want to learn more mm. and you want to get involved, then why don't you come take this class? Absolutely, yes. Why don't you come take, I'm talking to uh, the pastors uh, out there who have diverse congregations, have mm. significant uh, a significant African American demographic in your sanctuary. Uh, why don't you come and take this class? Come on now, that's Stuff right. for that's you. Right. It will help you, uh, just like it will help us. So I'm I'm challenging any of my evangelical brothers and sisters to please come out. Awesome. All right. Anything else? If not, let's have a word of prayer, and uh, I'm going to put my screen up to let everybody go, but thank you all so much for your time tonight. Let us pray. God, we thank you for this time. We thank you for Dr. Moore and his ministry. We thank you for the passion that you have instilled in him about teaching and instructing and living Black history. We pray now that everyone who's here has been blessed by this experience. God, we are simply trying to do ministry here, uh, ministry that ministers to the whole person. And so, God, we pray that you would continue to bless Dr. Moore and his family. Uh, bless him as he continues to do the work that you've called him to do. We ask that you bless Crosswork as we continue to try to, try to do ministries that will help the community in which uh, she sit or we sit. And so we thank you right now, God, uh, for this time. We thank you for our leaders who are on the line. We thank you for every member, every visitor uh, who's here. And God, we pray that you would send people by the droves uh, into this class so that they can learn uh, something. They will be all the better for it when they come out. We thank you and we praise you in Jesus' name. Amen.